Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Media Relations 101, the second session in BioNB's Winter Webinar Series. My name is Jenny, and I am the Marketing Coordinator here at BioNB, and we're excited to have partnered with the Technology Management and Entrepreneurship Center at UNB to bring you these sessions. Uh, so BioNB strives to serve anyone who's involved with business, research, and innovation, so we're excited to have access to their network as well. Today's webinar, Media Relations 101, is being presented by Heather McLean. Um, Heather is an award-winning communications and marketing practitioner with over 15 years experience. She was the recipient of the New Brunswick Rising Star Award, as well as the Capital Region Tourism Association Industry Person of the Year Award for her work in promoting both the high-tech sector and tourism industries in the province. Heather was also a finalist for Canada's Top 40 Under 40 for her work in promoting Canada's first airline travel bank. Heather was the driving force behind Canada's first utility that began using social media and has been recognized by the CBC as an authority on social media and communications. She has been the corporate spokesperson for several organizations, including a multi-billion dollar utility. Her research and professional expertise has resulted in numerous quests to share her expertise and speaking events in Canada and U.S., including being a featured speaker at Canada's Digital Media Summit. Her work has been syndicated in Yahoo Small Business, CMO.com, Leaders West Digital Media, PR News, Workplace Review, Business to Community, and more. We welcome Heather and McLean, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Jenny. So let's, uh, let's get started with Media Relations 101. And if you have any questions, feel free to jump in and uh, post them in the chat box, and we'll take it from there. Uh, so Jenny gave you a bit of an overview of myself, uh, and I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, my company, TaylorMade Solutions. We're a leader in transforming businesses into social enterprises. So everything from traditional media and marketing and advertising all the way up to including social media. We work with our clients to help them uh, reach out and engage with and communicate with their customer base and stakeholders. And it's all about uh, turning transactions into increased revenues. Uh, so these are some of the places that my uh, clients are located in, New York, United Kingdom, Victoria, Mexico, uh, et cetera. We work with small, uh, small business, medium business, public and private sector, as well as not-for-profit. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. You can see me there. Uh, and again, as Jenny mentioned, these are some of the places that you can find some of the work that I do in terms of publications. So let's get started. Um, what, we'll, what I'll cover today. I always like to go through some assumptions that I have of people participating in the webinar. Uh, the takeaways that I would like for you to have, uh, some proactive versus reactive media, characteristics of a good spokesperson, working with the media, some top do's and some top don'ts, uh, as well as questions, and again, feel free to ask questions at any time. So the assumptions that I have is that you do want to do proactive media, but of course, you might have to do some reactive media at times. And the reactive media, of course, are usually the things that we um, find controversial or troublesome and don't necessarily always enjoy doing. And of course, that you're willing to practice because the more you practice in doing your media relations and doing media interviews, the better you become. And this is particularly important for uh, people who don't do media very often. It's, uh, it's good to do that practice. And the fact that I'm hoping that everyone understands that there are people who are just not cut out to media relations. Uh, I've worked in organizations where uh, we've done a lot of coaching and training with people uh, to, to do media and they're just not comfortable to do it uh, or they're just, they don't have the characteristics of a good uh, spokesperson. And it is better for the individual and the organization to not force those people into those rules. And of course, there's a saying that we have in, in PR, they have more ink than you, and that you supply just to printed media. But essentially what that means is if, uh, if something doesn't go the way you like it, uh, there's no point in getting into an argument or uh, um, a controversial conversation with any member of the media because uh, they have more ink than you, or they have more air time than you, um, or they have more radio time than you. So it's just something not worth doing. And of course, in media relations, patience is a virtue because it takes time to build relationships, and you're often 
um, waiting on trying to get a story covered, or it may not be covered at all. So the takeaways that I'd like for you to have today is have a better understanding of how to work with the media, uh, in particular how, how to work with journalists and what they need and what they think, and tips on how to prepare for an interview, as well as the top do's and don'ts when uh, working with the media and doing interviews. And again, focusing on that practice. So if we look at proactive versus reactive media, uh, there are a number of forms that that comes in. Uh, of course, press releases, press conferences, pitching your story and idea to uh, the media, holding events, uh, crisis management, if you want to be the one that gets out there and delivers the message first versus having someone else come to you. And of course, blog posts can be used as a form of proactive media. And of course, if it's controversial, you telling the story versus someone coming to you and asking you about it is much more powerful. Your stakeholders, customers, and the general public will, in general, have a better um, feel and appreciation for a company that comes forward to share something that's con controversial rather than having the media or someone like a, a journalist come and kind of do a, a gotcha that you did something wrong. And of course, then you control the timing and you control the message versus someone else. So if we look at some reactive media, this is typically always a response issue. So the media have learned of something, whether it's about a service problem or a product problem, but it's usually someone or some other event has triggered the media to call you, and this is something that you may not even be prepared for. And it really does give con complete control to the media or special interest groups that may have informed the media um, about what's happening and then they have control of the message and ultimately your brand and reputation. Uh, and this happens quite a bit in, in the media world where uh, you can think of an example uh, in terms of restaurants where there may have been some um, behavior of people behind the scenes where they're doing things to food and taking pictures of it and it gets out on the internet and then of course a news crew shows up at the restaurant wanting to talk to the manager about this and they had no idea until the media walked in. So it's always better to be prepared and to have, have control over that timing. So this is kind of what we're used to seeing as, as regular people, what we see in the media. Uh, oftentimes, you know, they're more familiar people, famous people, um, sometimes politicians, and it's usually on um, all these, all these uh, images here. It's about reactive um, media where people are being inundated with media asking questions and wanting pictures and getting commentary. So thankfully, most of us will never have to deal with that. Uh, but there, there are some people that will have to do, do that type of media and be prepared for it. And I can tell you from experience that if you're not used to having, you know, multiple cameras and microphones stuck in your face, it can be a little daunting and overwhelming. So uh, even just practicing at some point with people doing that, taking a bunch of cameras and, and microphones and putting them in your face, kind of gives you a feeling for that, and they get really close to you. So it's, it's when I'm helping people with their training, it's always beneficial for them to have that experience because it's unlike anything you've ever had. So I'm going to switch over to uh, a video clip that I'd like to play for you. Um, and this is one that we, we like to use in media training because it's everything you do not want to do. So I'll play a little bit of this and, um, and talk about what's, what's good and bad about it. Senator Collins, thanks for coming in. It's a great pleasure, thank you. Yeah. This ship that was involved in the incident off Western Australia this week... Yeah, the one the front yeah. fell off? Yeah. Yeah, that's not very typical. I'd like to make that point. Well, how is it untypical? Well, there are a lot of these ships going around the world all the time, and very seldom does anything like this happen. I just don't want people thinking that tankers aren't safe. Was this tanker safe? Well, I was thinking more about the other ones. The ones that are safe? Yeah, the ones the front doesn't fall off. Well, if this wasn't safe, why did it have 80,000 tonnes of oil on it? Well, I'm not saying it wasn't safe, it's just perhaps not quite as safe as some of the other ones. Why? Well, some of them are built so the front doesn't fall off at all. Well, wasn't this built so the front wouldn't fall off? Well, obviously not. How do you know? 
Well, because the front fell off and 20,000 tonnes of crude oil spilled into the sea caught fire. It's a bit of a giveaway. I just like to make the point that that is not normal. Well, what sort of standards are these uh, oil tankers built to? Oh, very rigorous maritime engineering standards. What sort of thing? Well, the front's not supposed to fall off for a start. And what other things? Well, there are uh, regulations governing the uh, materials that they can be made of. What materials? Well, cardboard's out. And? No cardboard derivatives. Like paper? No paper. No string, no sellotape. Rubber? No, rubber's out. Um, they've got to have a steering wheel. There's a minimum crew requirement. What's the minimum crew? Oh, one, I suppose. So the allegations that they're just designed to carry as much oil as possible, uh, oh, the consequences, I mean, that's ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. These are very, very strong vessels. So what happened in this case? Well, the front fell off in this case, by all means, but it's very unusual. Mr. So McCollins, why did the front book fall off? Well, a wave hit it. A wave hit it? A wave hit the ship. Is that unusual? Oh, yeah. At sea, chance for millions. So what do you do to protect the environment in cases well, like this? Well, the ship was towed outside the environment. Into another environment? No, no, no. It's been towed beyond the environment. It's yes, not in the sure. environment. No, but from one environment to another environment. No, it's beyond the environment. It's not in an environment. It's well, been towed be beyond the environment. Well, what's out there? Nothing's out there. Well, there must be something. There is there. nothing out there. All there is is sea and birds and fish. And? And 20,000 tonnes of crude oil. And what else? And a fire. And anything else? And the part of the ship that the front fell off. But there's nothing else out there. Senator Collins, thanks for joining us. Void. Perfectly safe, Brad. So there you can see that uh, this was an example of everything that you would not want to do in a media interview. Um, not only did he use negative language, um, he was jumping in and adding too much information. Uh, it, while this is a spoof, it's a great example to show people. Uh, because there are times that I've actually seen um, real-life people do interviews and think, oh my goodness, someone stop that person and help them from, from doing what they're doing. So this is a, a really great example. He's saying all the wrong things. He's um, not confident about what he's talking about. And certainly, if this were a real-life situation, it would not go well for this, uh, for this organization at all. So let's look at what, what are the great characteristics of a spokesperson. So they know the audience. Uh, that's a very important thing to know uh, up front, who, who's going to be listening to the piece or who's going to be reading it and having a full understanding of that and understanding the media. And that's obviously what we're going to be talking about today in terms of what they're looking for and how to help them do their jobs. They have to be cre uh, credible and also disciplined and disciplined in the sense that when they are speaking to the media, um, they are very much on message but not robotic, and also uh, are comfortable with the fact that once they say their, their information, that they're able to stop talking. Um, this is a, a big tip for people, that when you have a message, you keep it short and sweet. You do not keep talking, and even if there's a, several seconds of silence, a reporter will eventually ask a question. But Reporters will take uh, an opportunity if there are people that just continue to talk. Um, that's when people get themselves in trouble. They will say things that they didn't mean to say or stumble over their words and sometimes um, provide information that will give a reporter some, another question asked that they hadn't anticipated. So definitely empathy is an important thing, particularly uh, in a situation like we just saw. I did not see any em empathy on that uh, Gentlemen, if he were a real person with that much oil going into the environment, that would not be a good thing. Um, confident but not arrogant, that's very important. We see uh, many people that are overly confident and um, not, not able to connect. So it looks like we have a question. So uh, Jenny, why don't, we, uh, why don't we check in on that? So this person's wondering, should there be one person in the company who should be nominated as a spokesperson instead of letting everyone else talk to the media or everyone in the whole company? That's a great question and it really is one of those questions or answers that it really depends on the situation. So for the most part, you should have a, um, a identified spokesperson, but depending on the situation, you may wish to bring in a subject matter expert to uh, provide additional information, or if it's a very serious matter, you may wish to have a part of someone from senior management or a CEO do this, be the person to speak on it. Uh, one that I think about was um, a few years ago when Maple Leaf Foods had the listeria incident and a number of people died. Um, rightly so, the president and CEO 
was the one that spoke on this issue, and he, he did a fantastic job. He knew his audience. He was credible. He was empathetic. And it's in that case, it was very much the right thing for him to do, rather than have someone like myself who would be a spokesperson. Uh, you want that senior management person to take that credibility and that responsibility and speak to uh, your audiences. Um, so I'm going to keep going unless there's a, an additional question. Um, it's also important for a spokesperson to be flexible because sometimes, uh, and adjustable, sometimes you may be doing an interview, say you're on camera and you're in an office building and then the reporter thinks, okay, this isn't working, I want to go outside and stand on the sidewalk. Uh, a good spokesperson is going to be able to go with that and go outside and not be distracted by people walking by in the sidewalk or cars or what have you. Um, of course, they have to be authentic and they have to be able to understand the role that they're there for the organization they're representing to get a message out. And I don't like to think about it as spin. I like to think about it as uh, positioning the company and telling the truth and giving good information that's going to give customers, stakeholders, the general public accurate, credible information. And they should be accessible, uh, but very professional. So if you are trying to get a hold of someone in an organization, uh, if I'm a reporter and I'm calling and calling and you're not responding, um, that's not really good. You have to either decline an interview or uh, decide to do one and set a time to do it. Uh, so you have to be accessible. So what is it that journalists really want? Well, here's a, a quote I, I quite like from The Guardian, and the, the greatest felony in the news business today is to be behind or to miss a big story. So speed and qu quantity substitute for thoroughness and quality for accuracy and content, and that's so true. Um, we're going to talk about some of the challenges that reporters have uh, just in a second, but certainly speed is, is very important for reporters today and for publications and any news, news media outlet. So who are they? Um, first and foremost, there are fewer reporters today. Um, as we all know, many media outlets are undergoing tremendous change and downsizing, so there are fewer. Uh, there are a lot more freelancers out there, so it's difficult to form relationships, both with reporters because they're so busy and trying to focus on what they're doing, and also as a PR person trying to build a relationship with the freelancers is difficult as well because that person may not be on, on the beat uh, in a week or so. And the image that I have there is, you know, for PR people, don't expect to become, you know, uh, buddies that you're going to be cuddling up to each other. If you become a friend with a reporter and that's possible, that's great but don't expect everyone to, to be right there and be your best friend. And they have to have those uh, instant news information pieces to compete. Uh, with, with, the, with the internet now, we all know that's one of the top sources and places that we go to find out information. Uh, and they, ha they have to get that information, so they're competing with everyone, including citizen bloggers, citizen journalists, uh, to to get information to get out there. I know whenever Whitney Houston died, I was online, I was on Twitter, that's where I found out about it, went to CNN, went to a few other sources, there was nothing for two hours that confirmed that that was true. So more and more people are going to those type of sources to try to find information, and that's what journalists are competing with. Time limits, they have very little time, they're under pressure uh, to complete stories and get the information out there um, constantly. And of course, as I mentioned, they're competing with, with bloggers now all the time. And there's just a tremendous amount of noise out there. Uh, there are many, many uh, PR people that are trying to get the attention of reporters. Um, you know, there's many stories that are happening. It, it really makes a big difference in terms of what's happening. And, and just a, a, some tidbit here from, from Cision. Cision is a news media monitoring uh, source. And 89% of journalists are using blogs now for research, and 65% are using social network sites like Facebook and LinkedIn, and that's a big shift from a, from a few years ago. Uh, you just didn't see that happening. So it's happening increasingly that they're looking for stories there as well as supporting material. So what do they want? Well, quite frankly and quite honestly, they're looking for stories about conflict, controversy, or interesting characters. 
And as you can see by the image to the right, Kim Kardashian fits kind of all of those. And that's why when this photo and the other ones that accompanied it, um, you know, the, she almost broke the internet because there was so much going on and so many posts out there. Um, now, are a lot of journalists looking for Kim, Kand Kim Kardashian st uh, stories? No, not necessarily. But they are looking for something that's as sensational as that. And as PR people or people who want to get the attention of media, we have to think about the fact that we're competing with timelines, bloggers, uh, other PR people, and then stories like this, what's capturing people's minds. Again, uh, you know, what's the hook? What's the story when you reach out to uh, a journalist to catch their attention? Again, they're looking for that conflict and controversy or characters with, you know, great color. And, you know, you have to think about really, is your story of news value? Are, are, are people going to get really excited about it? Or is it something that's going to be of interest to a very small group or your organization alone? And again, they want originality too. They want original stories. So for example, if you look at, this, at these two stories, company X gives $500 to charity or it could be $50,000 to charity. Or a headline that says, Naked Man Takes Over City Hall. Chances are most people are going to read the second one versus the first one. And you know, anyone, any organization that gives money to charity, you know, it's it's a good uh, social thing to do. It's the right thing to do. We want people to know about the fact that the charity is being supported this way. But chances are, if there's a headline like the second one, we're going to lose out, unfortunately. But again, if you're approaching a reporter or a journalist, you have to think about what's going to sell because they are in the business of selling news. So here's a quote from Morley Safer talking, and this is a, a few years old now, but he talked about the fact that the blogosphere is no alternative to real media, and he's, you know, he thinks that bloggers are um, kind of out there and um, anyone can do it. So he's talking about good journalism being structured and responsible. Well, as, as great a news person as Morley Safer is and was, um, he was kind of wrong, because <laughs> we saw very much the rise of citizen journalism and these are just some examples of what you see out there. And again, where people are going for news sources and where mainstream media is competing. And we've all heard the stories about mainstream media being under siege. So on the left, you see one uh, Rocky Mountain News. That was a publication that was around forever and in 2009 folded. We've seen layoffs at all of these other publications or, or media outlets uh, in the last few years, and they continue. Uh, you know, in the, in the last year alone, we see CBC re revising how they do things and um, revamping the focus of online and more video. So it's a changed world for the media outlets for certain. So let's talk about how you prepare to do a media interview and to pitch. So some top do's for being proactive. Make sure you have a quality media release. So again, think about it from the perspective of is it original? Uh, is it colorful? Does it have uh, something that's really interesting? Do you want it to have um, conflict in it? No, of course not. But again, if you are doing a controversial issue that you're trying to get out ahead of everyone, it could very well have that. So have a quality media release. Have your approved key messages done up in advance when you do your proactive pitch uh, and develop questions and answers. So those are really good key uh, areas to focus on because it helps you prepare for the interview or if you're preparing someone else, it's kind of what if questions that could be asked and how you would answer them. This is a very great tool for, for people doing interviews. Of course, you can't have them with you, but you get familiar with them. And you practice, practice, practice. So we have a question about media releases. So Jenny, why don't you uh, go ahead and let me know what that is. Hi. Um, so they ask, do press releases oh, work? Yep. Is it better to keep a blog or to contact media more directly by phone or email if you have something to convey? Press releases still work in some cases, and sometimes you want to have them for historical purposes. 
Uh, you can't rely on a press release doing it all for you. Oftentimes you will have to follow up with the media person, or the journalist rather. Um, it, it's something that we still do, and it is still an important part of what we do, um, but I wouldn't rely exclusively on it. You still want to follow up. Uh, if you do have good relationships with reporters, you kind of give them a heads up as well. Uh, so it's still, it's still part of the toolkit, but it's not the be-all, end-all. There's a follow-up question. As well, have fact sheets available, and the fact sheet... Oh, sure, go ahead. Sorry. Um, they ask, should you have media packages available at events? Yeah, I would, definitely, and that's part of where I was just going for the fact sheets, actually. So you can have fact sheets that help reporters um, have additional information and things that they can pull from, a, from, a, from the fact sheets in terms of statistics and so on that they may not remember. And the same goes for photo and video. That's something if you have some uh, additional pieces that they can use to help make their life easier, it's definitely something that you should do. And if it's good quality pieces that can support them, they're going to be interested in having those kits, so definitely. And another important part is when you're doing the pitch, make sure you're approaching the right reporter or editor or publisher. Um, for example, if you're here in the province and you want to um, talk to someone about a lifestyle uh, piece with CBC, you wouldn't contact Jacques Petra, for example, because he's a provincial affairs reporter. And the same goes for the Gleaner, the Telegraph Journal. It's good to know what beat a reporter has so that when you approach them, it's actually something that they can write about or do. Because uh, if you don't approach the right person, um, that kind of, they might just dismiss you straight out. And a tip, uh, don't release a bad news on a Friday. Uh, I worked for an organization a few years ago where we had a good news story that we wanted to release, but we weren't ready to release it at the beginning of the week. And I remember saying to my boss at the time, saying, please tell me we're not going to release this on Friday afternoon, which was uh, the Friday before the long weekend in August. And um, it turned out <laughs> that he came to me on the Friday and said, we're going to do this at 3 o'clock. And I recommended against it uh, however he wanted to proceed, so we did. And the first round of media was positive. The media were very angry at me, by the way, because when I called them to give them a heads up, they wanted to head out early, go with their families. Um, the first round of, of media coverage was positive, but as people got thinking about it, they thought, okay, there must be something more to this that they're not telling us, and it actually turned from positive to negative. So, again, do not release a bad news story on a Friday or even a good news story because it will be perceived as you're trying to bury it in the weekend. So pitching uh, some do's. Make sure it is news and that it's newsworthy. And again, if it's not, if it's not, make sure it's something that's not only important to your organization. Do reference third-party data. So if you can bring in some research from other organizations that support what you're doing or support um, your initiative, that's very good. They like that. Give plenty of lead time. Don't call someone on a Thursday morning at 10 and say, here's a great story for you. Can you do this and have it in the paper for tomorrow or on your newscast for 6 o'clock tonight? Um, that probably won't happen because they'll already have their assignments. And unless it's something over the moon, uh, they're not going to drop what they're doing. And again, approach that right uh, reporter or editor. Do your research up front. And use the name of the reporter. If you're emailing a reporter or calling them, uh, particularly email, don't do dear reporter, because uh, that will likely just get someone, they won't get even past that, they're just going to delete it. And use, a, use flattery, but use it appropriately and be meaningful and truthful in it. If you saw a piece that the reporter did and you really liked, you know, share that with them. Uh, but again, if it's not authentic, they'll be able to see through that. And for email, keep it short and to the point. And you can see on the right-hand side uh, an ex examples of bad subject lines. Um, press release or putting your name in the press release uh, or the subject line or putting anything in caps, all bad ideas. Keep your subject very on point and make sure it's a good subject line so that they read it. And if you don't know the reporter, make sure that you put some context around who you are and why you're doing this pitch to them. That will be quite helpful. So a few more. Um, 
do provide some people or uh, other sources that can be interviewed to support them. Again, be very truthful. Do not exaggerate on any points because that will come out. Have your photos and video ready. Personalize the story. Tell it so that the reader or the viewer can understand it. It will help go a long way in terms of getting that reporter's issue uh, or uh, attention. Um, in some cases, you may wish to offer an exclusive to uh, a pr particular outlet, and that will be very appealing to people as well. If you promise to only give the story to them, chances are they'll cover it if it's a really great story. And develop angles as well. Say, you know, here's a way you can look at it, or here's another way we can approach it. Everything you can do to help the reporter will go far for you. And appreciate that they are busy. So again, don't just jump in there and hope that you can call and have your story done that day or the next day. And even if you are not the person who is going to be interviewed for the piece that you're pitching, do be prepared to be quoted, because uh, that could very well happen. And prepare your organization and management team that you could be quoted as a part of doing the pitch. And that's an important one to remember. So some don'ts. Uh, don't send out press releases unless warranted. Some, some organizations like to send them out weekly. Uh, if there are known bloggers in your area, hey, why not include them? They'll appreciate it, and because th that you're including them, chances are they'll, they'll include you in what they're doing. Never ask for a reporter who is not following you on Twitter to send you a direct message. Um, that just screams all kinds of things, and they're, they're not going to do it anyway. And don't be a pest when following up. You know, follow up once, and if they say no thank you, then move on. Um, if you follow up and they say, yeah, we're interested in doing this story, but not today or tomorrow, then give them that time and then follow up. Um, but, you know, if after that point it's not happening, then move on. And if you do become uh, closer and develop, develop a relationship with a media person and they give you a personal email or phone number, don't abuse that. Uh, keep that keep that line in place, and that'll be better for your relationship as well. Don't mass tweet reporters trying to get their attention. Uh, avoid pitching the really self-serving stories. Uh, and there are many of those out there, and don't and don't try to say, well, hey, you should do this story because this other outlet's covering it. That doesn't work, and it it sometimes reverses what you want done. And again, don't do a shotgun approach. Just don't send out a mass email and say, dear reporters, here's a great story that you should do. And never pitch in public. Uh, again, try to customize that and focus on the individuals in one-on-one, -on -one, whether telephone or email. Uh, you know, pitching over social media. Uh, again, reporters don't tend to like that. So for your reactive pieces, and this is very important. So again, you know, if you get a call of something that you weren't expected to know about or a breaking story, you know, get the facts. You can say to them, look, you know, I don't have the information right now. Tell me what you're looking for. When do you need this done by? And I'll get back to you. And then you need to develop your key messages and your questions and answers and practice a bit or help someone else who may be doing this to practice. Again, get photos and vi video ready. But again, respect, respect the reporter's timeline and know that it's time is of the essence, which is also important for you because you want to make sure that you get your story out there as much as possible and don't let it go into a, a second day news cycle where there's more and more negative stories that could be brewing. So let's talk about the actual interview and, and what to do and what not to do. And I have these mixed together in, in five interview tips. And again, feel free if there's any questions to, uh, to jot those down. So before the interview, uh, always know the topic. And this is more on the reactive side. So if someone calls you, don't be afraid to ask about, you know, what is it that you're looking for? What is the deadline? Will it be recorded? Is it going to be live? Who else are you talking to? Uh, about this particular topic. I've only had one time in my career where a reporter would not tell me who else they were speaking to, and I knew the editor very well, so I called the editor, and the editor told me. Um, it's a very common question for, for PR people to ask. And as a tip, many seasoned spokespeople and PR people will only do live interviews. 
And this is a um, particular important, important point for controversial issues. Uh, that way you really do have an opportunity to get your message out there and not have um, clips taken that are taken out of context. Uh, so this is an important point for people to, to remember. So be prepared. Uh, always inquire about the reporter, if, say if it's a producer or editor calling you. Uh, find out who that person is, and if you're not familiar with that reporter, do a quick search, a Google search to find out what else that person has done, or go on the media's uh, website and, and look at some of the interviews that the person has done. Um, try to understand what their agenda is. Again, ask the question, you know, what is it that you're looking for? Who else are you talking to? Uh, it, you know, if it's if you're um, getting some people that are being interviewed that are contrary in opinion to what you're doing, then you know it's going to be a controversial topic. Um, prepare your questions and answers. Think in sound bites in terms of if you say these words, is this something that they're going to use? And try to prepare that way. And this, these are things that you do have to practice if you're not used to doing it and understand how to bridge questions. So if they ask you a, a question like, you know, why did the, sh the front of your ship fall off? Uh, you don't want to say, well, the front of the ship fell off because you start to think, well, there's particular inc uh, incidents that happen, or uh, let's, let's talk about what's really important here. You have to bridge those questions and bring them back. And if you're not ready when you get the call to do an interview, then tell them, you know, give me a uh, half an hour and I'll get back to you. Do whatever you can to stall to get ready, because nothing is worse than trying to do an interview for which you have no information and you're not prepared. And the same goes if you're helping someone else get prepared for an interview. You need that prep time to think about your messages and get, get information sometimes because uh, you just might not have it at your fingertips. So don't be a robot. Um, Try not to use jargon. Uh, that's a very important one because most people just aren't familiar with all the terms that you use. Uh, of course, use facts and sources. Don't sound like a commercial and, and just repeat the same thing over and over again. And as I mentioned earlier, it's important not to talk just to fill the space. Feel free when you're done your message to just be quiet and they will, the, the reporter will always start asking other questions. And good, good spokespeople just know when to stop. And of course, be human. It's that whole empathy side and, and remembering that you're talking to people like you in living rooms and offices um, all around the area. And of course, never say no comment. That's just something you never do because that is the piece they will always quote you on. Look the part, and I'm not just talking about flash and no substance. If you are a scientist, then wear clothing appropriate to a scientist if you're on camera or getting your photo taken for a piece. Uh, if you are an office person, then wear a suit uh, or something close to a suit. And white or blue shirts are often recommended uh, because they're considered fresh and clean and blue is an image of trust. And solid colors work best. It's less distracting. And these are all things that are going to help, help you be better in the media. And of course, uh, understand boundaries. Never ask a reporter for the questions in advance. They won't give them to you. Um, don't ask to review the piece before printing or publishing. Again, not going to happen. There's no such thing as off the record. The, the recorder, the microphone, the camera, it's always going. Um, I used to say to people who don't do media very often, if, if they said something they didn't like and say, let's do that again. Um, that's changed in the last few years. Uh, I, now, I now recommend to people don't ask for a redo because even if you do it, there's a chance that the other piece could be still used. Never badmouth others in an interview. And after uh, a piece is done, never, never call back and complain about a headline. Uh, the reporter doesn't typically write the headline. That would, be, um, that would be the editor or publisher doing that, and they have no control over it. Um, and of course, if there is a misquote or a wrong name used, you do call about that. But uh, it doesn't usually help to go after someone and complain about the misquotes, or um, I shouldn't say misquote, but in terms of a, a wrong headline or something taken out of context. If, if, if it's not in quotes, 
then they do have some liberties. But if it's something quoted that's uh, in quotations that's wrong, go back on that. So some practice tips. Uh, watch TV news clips without sound. Now you can do this for your own clips or other people and you will get a real sense from people if they look trustworthy, uh, do they look uptight, and that really is a way for you to help practice and understand the behaviors of what looks good on camera and what does not. And ha practice having people ask you multiple questions and do that quite frequently and record yourself and do that. Have other people watch it and of course uh, honestly critique you. Uh, so I think we have another question. Um, so this person asks, um, I noticed that reporters are recording things more and more. Can I, can I ask my interview to not be recorded? Um, that's a good question. I've never done that. I don't think a reporter would do that because they're going to, in some ways that's good for you because they are trying to get it accurate and have it in the right context. Um, it works two ways though. You could, if it's a radio interview or if it's a, a print interview, you could also record it. Um, I just don't know. I, I can't imagine any reporter saying that they would not record it because they're they're doing that to get the quote the right way and to get more information because they can only take so many notes very quickly. And I know when I interview people, even for blog posts, I record it and uh, use that information because I want to get the quote perfect. Uh, so I can't imagine that any reporter would agree to that. Um, and again, practice. If you're, not, if you're not doing media very often, at least once a year you should do this uh, practicing possibly twice a year. So we're coming up to um, quarter two. I did have a few other slides to show that I can kind of talk about the New Brunswick Media Source, but I want to see if there were any other questions uh, before we go into that. Yeah, we have one other. Um, they ask, how okay. do you know if your news story is newsworthy? How do you know if it's worth sending out there? Well, again, it comes back to, is it something that's unique and different? It's original. Um, is there some color to it? You know, is it uh, a new breakthrough and some research? Um, you know, chances are if it's a, a donation type story, uh, you're going to have to take an out, ad out for that. Um, I know years ago there was a company I worked for that uh, one of the executives won an award and the family really wanted a story done in the paper and uh, when I called the paper they said, look, we've had 15 calls from this person's family, uh, we are now annoyed, <laughs> take out an ad. So those type of stories, the self-interest self stories, are not ones that they look at. But if it's a new product, a new service, something that's going to benefit uh, the community, um, those are the type of things. And you can always ask a few people, do you think this is interesting? Is it something that people would care about? Um, it's, you, you start to, as you practice and, and look at it and think about, OK, is this different? Is it colorful? Is it into talking about characters, is that will guide you in terms of what's newsworthy. But again, even if it's a good news story, um, don't be surprised that if there's breaking news or something else happening, um, your story unfortunately will get lost in the mix or uh, not happen at all. That does happen. All right, any other questions, uh, Jenny? Um, we have another one. Um, she asks, what happens or how should okay. you react um, if you're misquoted? Should you mention it to the reporter? Should you make a big deal about it? Or should you just keep it to yourself? If it's not a big deal, I wouldn't bother. But if it's something that changes the context of, of what you said or is just flat wrong, I would call the reporter and, and talk to the reporter about it. I wouldn't make a huge deal out of it, but I would, I would ask for a correction. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind about corrections is, uh, unlike the original story, you don't get the same coverage. So if it's a print publication, for example, uh, you'll usually see that in a small correction um, piece. It'll be very small. However, it's still important to do, and if the story goes into another day or if there's a subsequent follow-up, at least they'll have the accurate information then.
Anything else, Jenny? I think that's it for now. Okay. All right. Well, I have a few more slides just to kind of give some context of the New Brunswick media market out there. So we have, you know, three daily newspapers, uh, English, and we have weekly newspapers, and uh, both in English and French, and independents. Uh, so I just want to give a little bit of landscape. This is a few years old. Um, Bristol did this. Uh, but you can see kind of like the breakout of where the newspapers are and where they cover between the dailies and the weeklies. And, you know, approximately 115,000 newspapers are circulated um, every day, or uh, 210,000 uh, community newspapers are distributed around the province. So sometimes you can get more pickup from the community newspapers than you can the three uh, main English dailies or the one daily French. So never discount those uh, publications. And in terms of, of TV, uh, you know, we have essentially four, CBC, CB, CTV, Global, and Rogers. And again, don't disc discount Rogers because it's got that community piece to it, so you can get uh, some good coverage there. Um, it's interesting to know that the newscasts reach only about 30% of all individuals over 18. Uh, and CTV continues to lead um, the news at six. Uh, so they're uh, very popular and um, of course go across all, all of Atlantic Canada versus uh, CBC uh, focuses just on New Brunswick, but I also think that's a benefit because uh, sometimes you can get those news stories on CBC focusing specifically on our New Brunswick market. And again, think like a journalist when you're preparing your key messages. Have a focus and have a focus statement. Um, for your key messages, try not to go beyond uh, three themes because it can get confusing for you. And always think about, for a press release in particular, for your headline of the press release, use what you would like to see as a headline. So sometimes if you're lucky, they do pick it up and they will use your actual uh, press release headline as their headline in the paper. And, it, and I've had that happen a few times, so it's always a good thing when it happens. All right, so that, that does come to the end of the presentation. Uh, and if there's other questions, I'd be happy to answer any of them. I think that's all the questions we have for now. Thank you, everyone, for asking all the questions you did. Um, and thank you so much, Heather. I thought that everyone got a lot out of that, and that was extremely informative, uh, especially for BioNB, because we often reach out to the media, so it's uh, great to be able to streamline our communications. Actually, we do have a question. Great. Excellent. <laughs> um, what did they ask? Um, so what is the best way to entice the media to come to your event? Um, well, there's a, there's a few variables to consider. Um, the first one is not always so easy to do, but try to plan your event uh, at a time that's convenient for reporters. So late in the day isn't necessarily the best and too early in the morning is also not good because a lot of them are just getting their assignments in the morning. So usually an event around 11 o'clock or early afternoon is better. And of course, um, having it in a location that's easy for them to get to. And uh, again, if it's not a busy day, you have a better chance of getting attention from the media. But if there's breaking news stories or other um, press events planned, chances are they're already booked. So I, when I'm planning any media event, I always try to check with uh, my fellow PR people and ask what they know is going on, if they know of any events in the next few days, and I try to plan around that accordingly. Uh, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw in terms of nothing breaking that day, um, but that's typically the things that I try to do is plan for an event that isn't going to interfere with another major event, uh, is at a time that's really convenient for them, uh, of course, not on the weekends either because many times outlets can't uh, spare the people because there's even fewer people working on the weekends and in a, in a location and an environment that's very easy for them to get to even if it's only for a few minutes. Do you have any general guidelines about um, a time during the week or a different day of the week that would be better than another? I would probably say, you know, between Tuesday and Thursday are the best. Um, Fridays are getting a little uh, busy and preoccupied. Mondays, um, Monday, early Monday afternoon might be good, but 
certainly not Monday morning because that's they're just coming back and getting back into gear on things. So I tend to focus between Tuesdays and Thursdays. Great. Um, we have another question here. They ask, how do you set boundaries with journalists and maintain a level of professionalism if you feel that the same courtesy is sometimes not returned? Um, yeah, it can be it can be tricky because they're under a lot of stress and pressure to get the story. Um, you know, as I mentioned, their their timelines are very tight, and oftentimes they have editors and publishers that are are pushing them. Um, I think the best thing to do is try to try to be 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 polite as possible, but also hold your ground and say, you know, if you can't respond within an hour you just explain that to them and say, I really need this hour and I will get back to you within, you know, five minutes after the hour, I'll be back to you. Um, as well, it's, it's, it's about maintaining that uh, air of uh, kindness as well as sticking to your guns. And that's the only thing you can do because um, they are going to do what they're going to do. And I mean, I've had reporters call me at home at uh, two in the morning one time I had a reporter call me at home because there was uh, an airplane circling the city and they thought it was in distress and ironically it turned out to be my brother-in-law doing flight training at night and uh, they thought it was a large plane and I knew by the sound of it it was a Cessna. Um, it was completely unnecessary to get the call but I didn't get angry with the person uh, because I know that the relationship has to be there for other times. Um, so if you were any other questions, Jenny? Yeah, one more. Um, if you gave an interview and um, in retrospect you said something that you would like to retract, um, do they do reporters have an obligation to obey what you would like them to do? No, <laughs> no. There's I would not. I would call to clarify things, but I would never call to say I'm going to retract something, because as soon as you say you're going to retract something. Uh, their spider senses just go off and go crazy. Uh, but definitely if you have to clarify something, and I, I have done that before, I've had um, information and a technical issue that I may not have quite had right, and after speaking to someone, after doing the interview, I realize, okay, I need to correct that, I would definitely call and correct it. Um, but I would never ask for retraction because they're not going to do it. Gotcha. Okay, so get it right the first time. So do we or, have or at least, you know, I mean, most, most reporters are good at understanding that you have to clarify things, so um, that's okay. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay, if that's it for now, um, again, I would like to thank you, Heather. Um, this was really fantastic. Um, for everyone, I really hope you got something out of this presentation. Um, IONB will be hosting more webinars this season. Um, just visit winterwebinarseries.splashthat.com and hit the RSVP link to stay in touch with us. Um, like I said, we'll be sending out a feedback survey this afternoon, so please take two to three minutes to fill that out. That would be a huge favor to us. So thank you very much.